Welcome to your online church family. We're glad to have you back with us. We're glad to be back in church here at Harmony. And we welcome, we have guests and visitors today. Um, I am personally blessed this morning to have a, a young man who has been a, an important part of my life for a number of years, Jimbo Potter. Welcome back home, son. Um, I won't go into any great length because they can't see you, and the people here, probably other than Sandra and I, may not know you. But this young man has been through drugs, alcohol, jail, brokenness. God's brought him back. Praise God. called me this week and he said, I'm going to be in church Sunday. I said, hallelujah. You're home, son. You're home. Where God brought you. He's cleaned your act up. He said to me on the phone the other day, he said, Pastor Dave, I don't know how to tell you what God's doing in our lives. He has a beautiful wife and a daughter. And uh, he said, I can't even describe to you. I can't tell you what God's been doing, but it's awesome and I want to see you Sunday in church. Thank you, son, for keeping your word. Matthew chapter 1. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted in the Greek is God with us. In John's writings, we often call it the Gospel of John. There are some theologians that would take umbrage with that, and I understand that. And I well remember being in class with some very learned scholars back in Bible college where I took a course called Synoptic Gospels. And they made a distinction between Matthew, Mark, Luke as the first three Gospels being the Synoptic Gospels or synonymous. They tell the same story, so to speak, each with a different point of view. Matthew obviously begins with Jesus' genealogy, takes 42 verses to tell us all about the line of Jesus and David and Jesse and where he was coming from. Um, Mark begins right in on his adult ministry, says nothing about the manger and the baby and all that. Luke, being a Gentile physician, does, spends two chapters talking about the little baby and the manger and the shepherds and all that. Then we come to John. Now, I, uh, for some of our new Christians, um, with whom I've been counseling the last couple of months and the last couple of weeks, they... <laughs> They, they, they did have done what typically new Christians do. They just kind of open the Bible, find a verse, and say, I don't know what that means, and I'll get a call. Pastor Dave, uh, what, what, how do you pronounce that word? And I just say, uh, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you especially go back in the Old Testament. You, you want some tongue twisters, go back there. But, but what I've said to them recently is, let, let me challenge you about something. Just concentrate on the book of John. The book of John is a theological book. It is the concise Bible in one book. Now, interestingly, the reason I'm giving you all of this as an introduction is you well know that the book of John begins with four words that we find one other place in the Bible. Aha. Uh -huh. I can hear you thinking. Genesis 1-1. One, one. 
In the beginning, God. The only other place that's in the Bible. In the beginning, God. Amazing that John would begin his writings with that statement. Now, John is writing, um, again, Bible scholars will vary a little bit, but most estimate between 80 and 90 AD. So all that he's writing, he's gotten kind of, obviously, secondhand reports, especially when he's writing about, for instance, let me just give you an example. How would John know about Jesus' first miracle? John 2, turning water into wine. Mary had to pass that story on. And it had to be passed on from Mary. And John takes this compilation of all of these stories that he's heard, and he concentrates on primarily who is God, who is Jesus, how can we know him, and what are the end results of knowing Jesus? You with me? So right, at, right up front, the very first thing he says is, in the beginning, God. Now, that raises a couple of questions. When was the beginning? Well, I heard a commentator this week trying to convince his audience that 66 million years ago, there were dinosaurs on this earth. And there was a cataclysmic collision in heaven among the planets and the stars and all kinds of, of heavenly bodies. And, and in this cataclysmic collision, the meteorites fell on the earth and destroyed all the dinosaurs, except for a few little tiny baby ones that existed. And that's why they're so tiny today, where they ruled the earth 66 million years ago. And I listened to him, and I wanted to call him and say, wait a minute, bro, I have one question for you. How do you know that? Was there anybody there who's given you a first-hand account? Because I can tell you, when I read the story of the beginning, I know the author. I know the creator. I know the one who started it all, who brought it into being. It's a cause and effect. If there's creation, there has to be a creator. And he existed before the beginning. I don't know when the beginning began. In reality, church, I mean, are you with me yet? In reality, there is no beginning. Because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit existed before the beginning. They're eternal. We mark the birthday of Jesus, December the 25th. Now, that, some, some wise business person came up with that. The owner of Macy's or Walmart or somewhere. I'm being facetious, okay. But no, Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. You say, how in the world do you know that? Well, one, one of the reasons we know that is shepherds would not have been on the hillside in the winter. <laughs> and it says the shepherds heard an angel and they came to the manger. <laughs> Does it really matter? Does it really matter? I mean, if you're a Christian today, every day is Jesus' birthday. If he's been born anew in you, every day you live is Jesus' birthday. So it's real simple. In the beginning, God. That's all we need to know. Now, John doesn't leave us hanging there. He, he just, he kind, of, he kind of enlarges that a little bit. And, and he uses about four or five different words. I'm just going to kind of lay them out for you. But I just want to underscore something again. If, if, if John says, in the beginning, then he sort of, he either ignores or he puts on the back burner all of the other stuff 
that we know about the birth of Jesus. Because John does not, now watch this. Think, think about it for a moment. John doesn't mention a manger. He doesn't mention Mary and Joseph. He doesn't mention shepherds. He doesn't mention wise men coming 18 months after Jesus was born in a caravan of 850 miles and a thousand of them traveling to find the child, Jesus, in a home. He doesn't mention any of that. He just starts where you start. In the beginning, God. Hmm. You do know that if, if God was in the beginning, then Jesus was in the beginning. And the Holy Spirit was in the beginning. Because they are eternally existent. They are three in one. We call it the Trinitarian theology. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So before this earth was birthed, God was there. I know it's upsetting to some politically to hear this, but climate change does not control the world in which I live. I know the maker who sends the climate change. His name is God. It's real simple. I have first-hand account. It's in the Word. Two different places. In the beginning, starts the Bible. John's Gospel starts again. In the beginning, God. Whoop! Exclamation point. Shut the Bible. Turn it all off. Quit listening to those critics and those false believers and the atheists and the agnostics and the doubters and all other religions except those who follow Jesus Christ because they got the wrong answer. So, oh, preacher Dave, that's not, that's not nice. You're talking about all other religions. Well, Mormonism doesn't believe what I believe. Buddha doesn't believe what I believe. I'm not looking to Muhammad to deliver me from sin. I'm not going to call Putin in Russia and say, hey, this is your buddy Dave in Harmony. Uh, could we hook one up here? I need a deliverer. You all haven't figured me out yet. See, I wasn't supposed to be here today. Some of you are saying, well, oh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, too bad. That didn't work out. <laughs> to our detriment, wish the other guy had showed up. In the beginning was Buddha. In the beginning was Muhammad. In the beginning was Confucius. Doesn't say that in my Bible. <laughs> in the beginning, what? Oh, this this one this one will wake you up a little bit. You know, and uh, <clears throat> you you people that live in in the wealthy area of the Delmarva. It's a county that begins with the letter T. I, I will not name that county. But all of you yuppie wealthy people that live in that, that county, not over here in the Caroline uh, farm country like the rest of us uh, regular people. <clears throat> that woke you up, didn't it? <clears throat> Do you know that in your wonderful county, I'm told just recently that there are about possibly 12 billion, not million, B with a billion heirs. I heard the other day that the third busiest airport. Now, you're learning things today that you're not going to get anywhere else. I mean, you, you could go to any church you want. You're not going to get this kind of information. And I know you need this to help your spiritual life. I heard the other day, Easton Airport is the third busiest airport in the state of Maryland. It's second now. Thank you. I just got a correction. Second only to BWI. You know why? Corporate jets. Now, my whole purpose in saying all that is, if you knew one of those billionaires or multi-billionaires with their chartered jets, would that satisfy you? 
You can say, in the beginning, billionaire, whatever his name is. And I know at least one of them. I have a mutual friend. He's a Methodist minister. Mutual buddy. This one owns half of Easton. He just bought out the other half. And if, if, if you would say, well, if I could just get with that person and I had their money or I could really be buddies with that person, I would have no problems in life. Great. I have one question for you. Is he going to buy your way into heaven? No. 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 See, someone already paid that price. Right there. He paid that price. In the beginning, God. How do you find God? Define. Well, I don't usually do a lot of reading, but I, I have a little list for you. I just, just, just to encourage you a little bit. Now, this is not all-encompassing. I only have about five or six, seven to give you. Just enough to whet your appetite. Who is God? How do you define God? What are the names of God? There are probably 30 in the Bible. But I, can't, I just pulled out, just cherry-picked a few. Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. He's my salvation. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Yes, you had it. Some of you just had it right on your tongue. Look, look can I just stop there? See, we, we have some young people here today. Uh, one of them prayed this morning. This, this, this young, and I, I'm, I, listen, this is unplanned. This, this was not pre-thought. So it, it, either it's of the Holy Spirit or Dave Griffin's just off on a limb, and it's okay. Cut it off if it's me on a limb. But the young man that prayed this morning up here, now you online didn't get to hear it. Th that young man, by the way, he got saved in jail too. He wasn't in jail. He was a guard in jail in Caroline County and knew nothing about Jesus until a pastor from a church, a little church over in Denton area, was holding Thursday night Bible studies. And this young man heard that Bible study and God spoke to him, it's called conviction. And he got a hold of his heart and he gave his heart to Jesus right there. <laughs> he, uh, I know it's upsetting to you, but he didn't come to Harmony Methodist Church and, and kneel at the altar. I mean, how can you get saved if you don't do that? It's the only way you can get saved. You've got to go to the Methodist church and kneel at the altar. That's how God prescribed it in the Bible. Oh, no, that's not right. I, I, I pastored some people that got saved at, a, at an altar in, in a, a church in Easton. I won't name. Every church I've ever pastored, I've seen people get saved outside of the church, the building. Oh, that's my, oh, that's my jump off point. Is this the church? No, you are. You are. This is just a building dedicated to God. I have to say this. No, I don't, but I'm going to say it. This empty chair over here, the lady that sat in that chair two weeks ago, she's in church today. <laughs> <laughs> She's in church. <laughs> I, I can hear her egging on my dad. Go ahead, pop up. Yell amen. Preach it, Peter. Look at that boy down there trying to preach. My mom, you need to help him. Go pull his coattail. He got lost somewhere. Because my mother used to threaten that every Monday morning. Boy, if I could be up there behind you, I'd pull your coattail. Your brother Bill could preach 20 minutes and say everything, have people crying and weeping and laughing. Here you go 30 minutes and you just can't get started. My number one critic. <coughs> I started to say, that young man believes that God is Jehovah Rapha. I've been with him when he laid hands on someone and experienced healing. Because God has gifted him with faith and the gift of anointing. Are you listening to me, church? I don't know what yours is, but you've got a gift from God. Every believer 
has a gift from God. Are you using it for Him? It's discernment. If it's empathy, which is what God put in my heart at age 15 when I was born again. There are seven to ten different spiritual gifts, all from one giver and all for one purpose, for the edification and building up of the body of Christ. They're not for us to go around and say, my gift is prophecy. I've got a word of knowledge for you. Well, go tell somebody else because I don't need it. I strayed a little bit, but you, you got the message? huh? Are you, some of you are just starting to wake up a little bit. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. He is my companion. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord is our righteousness. Jehovah Yah, the Lord is I am. It, eight times in the Gospel of John alone, Jesus says, I am, I am, I am. I don't have time to go through all of them, but he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the deliverer. I am your righteousness. I am your peace. I am God. Jehovah, I am. Oh, you all get me wound up this morning. I, 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 it's your fault. But I, listen, I'm not yelling at you. I'm trying to get through to you. He doesn't say, I was. That's past tense. I am. Am is a, is a verb that is in the present perfect tense, which means it is now, and it is tomorrow, and it was yesterday, and it will be next week. God, hear, hear it again, hear it again. God is with you. No matter what you're going through. He doesn't distinguish which is more important than another. Oh, you, you, you couldn't pay your bills this week. You, you're in ill health. Some sitting here have been through death with loved ones this week. They're hurting. Had one from our Ames sister church yesterday morning. I see you in Easton passed away. It's going on and on and on. I don't know when I've had so many funerals. I look back at my brother over here and they can't keep up with it. Look at Denver, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado. You think you got problems? Two entire towns, 20,000 each plus, wiped and burned to the ground and now snow on top of it while smoke simmers up. I don't know about you, church, but let me tell you something. I think God's trying to get our attention. Amen. If he did it to Pharaoh and he had took ten plagues to wake him up and he had to wipe this entire world clean with water one time, he's going to do it again by fire. So if you're playing church and your God is your religion and your little form of Christianity, I feel sorry for you because you're going to die in your sins without any hope. But if you know Jesus and you can say, God is with me, hallelujah. I can fight any storm the devil throws because he's a liar and a loser. He's under my feet. I have crushed his head and I declare on the name of Jesus and in the authority of Jesus that my God is in control today, right now, in my life. So Satan, take a hike. You say, Pastor Dave, does that mean he'll never come back? Oh, he'll be there before you get out the door. Unless you're a lukewarm Laodicean Christian. And I'm sorry if you are, because there's no hope for them. Because he said, if you're lukewarm Laodicean, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Mm. 
Wake up, church. It's time to quit playing church. Jehovah Sidkenu is our righteousness. Jehovah I am. God is with us. John begins it in the beginning, God. And he goes on to say in that first chapter, the word, W-O-R-D, that's Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. I'm just kind of through the introduction, but I'm going to wrap it up. Do you know what the Greek word right there is for the word became flesh and dwelt, D-W-E-L-T? The Greek word for that translated is tabernacle. Huh, let that sink in for a minute. The word, that's Jesus, capital W-O-R-D, Jesus became flesh and tabernacled among us. What's the derivative for that? What's the background for that? The Old Testament, Judaic culture. In the tabernacle, there were three sections, the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And only the presence of God was present in the Holy of Holies, and only once a year could the high priest, who was chosen only, and he only served one time in his entire lifetime as a priest, to be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And you know that when that happened, they would tie a rope on his ankle because if he got stricken by God or displeased God or, or was overcome with the presence of God, they were not allowed to go in behind the curtain or they'd die. So they had to pull him out. <laughs> but the word there, the word became flesh, Jesus, and tabernacled among us. Where's the tabernacle? You. Right here. The Word, Jesus, right there, became flesh and tabernacled in us. We're the tabernacle. We're the dwelling place of God. How do we know that, Holy Spirit? His spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. That we are one with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God created. And in his plan, he made a plan that his son would go to pay the price for our sins because we couldn't pay the price. And no sacrifice at the tabernacle would sacrifice and settle for our sins. There, was, there were two goats that were offered, you remember? The blood of one was sprinkled on the, on the altar place, on the Holy of Holies, on the Ark of the Covenant. And one the priest would take the blood, come out, place his hands on the other goat, and take it out into the wilderness that was called the scape goat. We don't have to go through that system anymore. We can come boldly to the throne of God because he paid the price right there. He settled it once and for all on the cross and he said, you can all come to me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because he's carrying you. When you can't carry yourself, when you feel beaten down, when the world's trying to take all the starch out of you, when you feel like God has abandoned you, go back to John 1 and remember Emmanuel. God is with you. Hallelujah. Amen. Stand with me. Guess what the closing course is? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. Revealed in us. His name is called Emmanuel. He's here. 
Some of you are just starting to turn the light on. I don't scream and yell to, please understand. This, I, I, I pray God, don't ever let it be about me. But I, I just can't come in here and read a 10 minute little thing off the computer and say, have a good day. I get a little fired up about this. Closer I get to heaven, the more fired up I'm getting. I told you what David Jeremiah's dad said to him one day when David walked in. He said, son, I got more friends in heaven than I have here. I'm starting to feel that way. I'm getting a little homesick to be with them. How about you? You ready? Is God with you? He's going to be there until you breathe your last. Actually, I think the rapture is coming to take us all. I believe it's right at hand. It's that close. It's that close. Every major prophecy has already been fulfilled. And in Israel today, prophecy is being fulfilled. Around the world, oh, I didn't mean to say all that. Well, I didn't plan to say all this. But around the world today, God is moving in ways you cannot comprehend. Let me tell you, below the radar, God is working in incredible ways. One of the places where the Christian church is coming alive and flourishing is Guadalupe, Mexico. All we hear are about the bounties and the, and the push, drug pushers and all the illegals coming. You know what? In Mexico at the line, they're having revival, 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 revival. Sean Foyt, a young man who's traveling in the world, Iran and Iraq, back in America, is traveling all over this nation preaching the word of God. About five weeks ago, I told you, up in Binghamton, or Rochester, New York, between Rochester and, and Buffalo, New York, in a little church of a hundred, they wanted to have a revival, brought in a West Coast evangelist, and started a revival that night with a thousand people sitting in the rain, and it went on for ten days, and now he's scheduled to come back for five different cities in New York alone. I want to tell you something. God's alive and working. Hallelujah. I just want him to have, do, do a little bit in Harmony, Maryland. I want to get in on it. My dad used to say, this is the quietest place you'll ever live. You better get used to screaming. So take my screaming and just tune it out if you want to, but be ready to meet Jesus because he's coming. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called God with us, revealed in us, his name is called Emmanuel. Sing it again. Lift your hands and praise to him. Emmanuel. Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise the Lord. Celebrate. Celebrate our Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is here, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is with us. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you showed up again. At least I feel something's happened. I know there's some people that's going to watch this this week. And probably wonder, what in the world is that church put up with every Sunday? It's okay. There are probably some people sitting here wondering, why did I come today? Just get screamed at by that preacher? But I just want you to know, I love you. God loves you. We're going to heaven together. If you're ready to meet him, if you aren't, my heart breaks for you. I wouldn't wait another week if I were you. I'd settle it today. No man knows what the day brings. 
We don't have any guarantees on tomorrow. But I can promise you this. God is with us today. God has been in this place today. He died to forgive you of your sins. All you got to do is say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm sorry. I can't make it any longer without you. Come in and fill me with your peace. Oh, I believe it's, hap it's happening right now. <laughs> oh, I feel it. Ooh. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You are Lord. His name is called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, say it with me, God with us. Amen. Go in peace.